my job tonight uh, talk a little bit about a family, connections, family, the experience of the family that came to this country, although I'm going to back up a little bit. For those of you who don't know, Regina was my great-grandmother, like everybody else here. Her daughter Paula was my great-grandmother. Minnie was her daughter, who was my grandmother. And Ira Oppenheimer was my father. I'll give you a little bit of framework for that. Um, I have afterwards some things that you can take if you would wish, mostly talking about the history of the Weiss and Cloud Company. I'd like also just to emphasize that one of the things, the thread through this is, as John said last night, is a story of immigration and the experience of people who came to this country. So in doing the research for this, most, what struck us most was the sense of connectedness and community that pervade the family, and by extension, Weiss and Cloud Company. Mommy? Yes? Can you stand by the water so people sitting here can see the pictures? Okay. <laughs> Do I have to stand in the closet here? <laughs> Sorry. Come out. Uh, I can't. Um, these were actually taken at the New York Historical Society, which has been mentioned several times. We spent a couple of days down there this spring. But the connections of the amazing family of first, second, third, and fourth cousins is strengthened by these reunions, but are based on the foundation of the original 14 who lived together, married each other's daughters, and cared for each other. For the family whose lives, for this family whose lives were so intertwined, it must have seemed natural to carry this heritage to this country where it was held together by Paula, Minnie, and Dave, and the family business. In Israel, it was held together initially by Max and Hava, and Leora now, and any of the others of you who are involved in the project, Savan I know, Moran, um, Ali maybe? Yeah? Okay. Um, this family of keepers has helped us to know each other. The 54 albums, started by Paula, continued by Minnie, as it says, were the playground of my childhood. The scrapbooks we have also hold immeasurable treasures, from Regina and David's marriage ketubah to Paula's birth certificate and the record of her marriage to Ignaz. The records of Weiss and Clow, as I mentioned before, are now at the New York Historical Society and represent the most complete collection of family-owned businesses in New York. No. On to Regina. We don't know much that, about her, other than that she was pregnant from the age of 20 to 40. <laughs> um, this portrait was painted in 1890 when she was 60 years old, several years after David died. Victor Weiss remembers seeing it at the age of 13 and wondering what happened to all of the jewels from Hava indicate that Regina was a very shrewd woman and quote, wore the pants in the family. She, wore, she ran the family business, the sale and distribution of flour to bakers and merchants. One example of her power in the family was that Carolina wanted to be a teacher. And even until her old age, she talked about this. But she was given one of the shops because quote, from this nonsense, one can make a living? Fred Singer remembers being taken to see her and being deathly afraid of her dog, of her and the dog. It seems Regina had a somewhat small, nasty dog named Daisy. When shown her first great-grandchild, Regina responded, take the baby away, it nerves the dog. And it's probably the only direct quote we have from her. I would like to add some family legends here. Thanks to Leora and Max's sleuthing, we know the names of seven of the 14 children who did not survive. Family lore explains that two of them died under rather strange deaths. One daughter was said to have been thrown out of the window while the sheets were being hung out to be aired. Another was said to have been smothered when a nanny rolled over her in bed. Another interesting legend, Regina's husband David, walking down the street, encountered a small boy and said, who is your father? And the boy responded, you are, Daddy. <laughs> Not hard to imagine, right? 
Virginia seems to have raised quite a few competent matriarchs in her own right, such as Carolina and Paula. Virginia died in 1916 at the age of 82. Where? In New York. No, in Vienna, in Bratislava, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm thinking Paula. Okay, here's the picture that you've all seen of the 13 with Regina and her mother, the Oberon Bright Lady. Um, but there are only 13 of them there. The question is, Paula was in the U.S., so I don't know when this would take. It says approximately 1891. Building on John's identification of the immigrant experience, Paula and Ignatz's story was typical of in immigrants sorry, in the 1880s, became impoverished, although Paula, with Paula's sizable dowry. And on these posters are several of the things that I'll refer to tonight. One of them is Paula's Ketuba and dowry, her birth certificate, and several other things that you can look at um, at your leisure. Um, uh, sorry. They built a thriving business in only a few years. In the beginning, they were poor enough that they took in a, a lodger. Nathan Clow, they took in a boarder, I'm sorry, Nathan Clow, and it was not uncommon for poor people then to share their apartments with other immigrants. Paul Frankel was born in 1861 in Bratislava, the third daughter of the surviving 14 children of David and Regina. This is the first picture that we have of her at the age of 17. Wow. Probably heavily corseted. I can't believe anybody had a waist <laughs> like that. <laughs> Paula married Ignaz Weiss, a native of Altufan, which is near Budapest, and was residing in Vienna on September 4, 1881. Oh, that's a nice picture. Despite prior glowing testaments to Ignaz's qualities as an exemplary employee of several grocery stores in December of 1980, 1880, a certificate from the director of the district director of Budapest indicates that, quote, on the basis of official investigation, the undersigned of the board of directors certifies that Ignaz Weiss, store clerk, son of grocer Jonathan Weiss, is destitute. By the time of his marriage, nine months later, he was a resident of Vienna. Paula, however, brought a sizable dowry to the marriage, including household items, a great deal of furniture, and 3,000 self-earned Austrian gulden. How did this formidable woman, Paula Frankel, meet an indigent grocer pursued by creditors and agree to marry him? <laughs> One possibility is that they met through the husband of her older sister, Emma, who was married to Emil Weiss, also from Budapest. Paul and Ignaz were not married in Budapest, in Bratislava, I'm sorry, as all of her siblings was, were, perhaps an indication of Ignaz's ignominy. Documentation and family lore indicates that the family, quote, sent him to America in order to remove Ignaz from the reach of bankruptcy and the law. He apparently was not a stable businessman. There's a record of Ignaz leaving Hamburg uh, in 1882, in March, on the SS Albigenia, accompanied by a brother, Benedict Weiss, he did have a brother named Bernard, we think, and a sister, Paul Weiss. Speculation, they traveled as siblings in steerage in order to remain together. They arrived in New York City on April 13th and settled near Canal Street in Lower Manhattan. Records show that the couple had five children, one child cannot be accounted for, although on Minnie's birth certificate, she's listed as the second child of the couple. As there was not time between the marriage and the departure for America to conceive and have a child, we think that the child may have been born in New York City, and although there's no known record of its birth or death, perhaps the family was too poor to provide a burial site. Daughter Minnie was born in 1886 on East Houston Street in New York City. There were two other daughters, Anna, born in 1888, who lived for two months, and Adele, born in 1891, who died in 1892 at 17 months. A son, David, was born in 1894, 
at 679 East 7th Street. As death rates were high among general population and particularly among the immigrant population. And here they are as babies and as what I call middle-aged children. <laughs> Ignatz's occupation on Minnie is listed on Minnie's birth certificate as jewelry store. At some point thereafter, he became a peddler on the Lower East Side. We know from the memoir of Victor Weiss of the Argentine branch that Paula, like <coughs> many immigrants, quote, sewed at home tablecloths made of oil cloth. Her husband sold them from door to door, and from that humble <coughs> beginning, they built up a sizable enterprise. Right. Ignatz's partner, Nathan Clow, a German immigrant who also arrived in 1882 was, and was naturalized in 1888. We don't know when he became a boarder in Ignaz and Paula's home, but we also do not know the year that the business changed from peddler's cart to incorporated business. But the company was formed with Nathan's brother Sam as the Weiss and Clow brothers and was doing business as such by 1890. The firm manufactured and sold, quote, table oil cloth and window shades. When Sam died in 1895, the firm became Weiss and Clow, incorporating in January of 1896 and lasting and existing until, oh, sorry, existing until 1966. In 1998, Ignaz died on Dave Clow's fourth birthday, David Weiss at that point, a fact that was not known to this family until recently when his birth certificate was found in Irish scrapbooks. Thereafter, Dave's birthday was celebrated on October 2nd. On October 11th in 1899, Paula and Nathan were married one year after Ignatz's death. As early as the 1890s, documents show that Paula was actively involved in the business, lending money by buying shares. She also served on the three-person board of directors, where she and Nathan replaced two non-relative members on the board six days after Ignatz's death. Mm -hmm. Paula also owned property in her own name and kept meticulous records of expenses and rent income until the time of her death. In less than 20 years, the family progressed into the upper middle class. There are census records showing that the Clow family spent summers in Deal, New Jersey, as early as 1900. This tradition seems to have continued for many years. Nathan adopted Minnie, then a 19-year-old minor, and Dave in 1905. A high school autobiography of Ira reads, it is known that he was subject to the usual childhood diseases. His sister usually contracted the diseases first and passed it on to him. His mother, assisted by his maternal grandmother, was continually busy as a result of this process. She was next to the oldest in a very large family and consequently, consequently had always had a hand in the raising of children, either her own brothers and sisters or her own children. The coming of her first grandchild, Ruth, had awakened dormant instincts and the coming of the second child, grandchild, Ira, gave her an opportunity to exercise these instincts. She was most attentive and kind. The second child, grandchild was accordingly very spoiled and very obstinate. Mm -hmm. We know that in the 19-teens and the 1920s, Paula, Minnie, and both her children, Ruth and Ira, returned to Europe several times to visit family. They were accompanied by the children's German nanny as well, no longer traveling in steerage class. Mm -hmm. Minnie kept detailed diaries of several of these trips, <coughs> writing about people, places they visited, who came to dinner and whose house. From these, one can get a real-time picture of how close the family was. The visitors went from one family home to another with gatherings at every stop. Whether this was a way of life for them or was provided for the American visitors is unclear, but it's still a fascinating picture of a remarkable family. Those diaries, part of those diaries from 1905 in particular, will be read tomorrow night at the Stories Night and I have copies to distribute of the entire diary for people who might want to read more. Ira's diaries concentrate on the weather, food, sitting in hotel rooms reading, with the notable repeated mentions of Uncle Max's fishing torts from his chocolate shop. It is because of these trips that Ira and Ruth maintained close contact 
with many of the relatives they had met show a very attractive young woman who over the years grew and grew and grew, mm -hmm. as it seems many Frankel women did. <coughs> the last picture we have of Paula is one taken with her granddaughter Felice Clown in July of 1924. Please note the leaves on the trees, a woman of great girth and magnificent warm clothes. A small mystery. This chest was, quote, given on her silver anniversary to Regina. We originally thought that this was given to Paula, but she did not have a silver anniversary with Ignatz, who died after 17 years of marriage. Paula's 25th anniversary with Nathan occurred in 1924, when Regina had been dead for eight years. <laughs> it turns out that Giza gave the chest to my parents with the stipulation that it be given to Minnie's oldest grandson, my brother Peter. Given this, we speculated that it came from, from Bertha to her daughter Giza. The only catch is that Peter had a vague memory of hearing that it, was, it had belonged to Emma, and the chest contains a card reading Emma with her birth and death dates in Iris' handwriting. Paula died in November of 1925 at the age of 64, leaving an estate worth $763,919. As recorded in the New York Times, and the distribution is here on the poster where Minnie, or where Paula's stuff is. It's a lot of money in those days. A letter from Nathan Clow to all the relatives in Europe described in great detail the death of Paula in November. This warm letter telling of Paula's death, presumably of a heart attack, although she was also diabetic. Her funeral, burial, and shiva were sent to Giza Lowenstein's husband so he could inform the rest of the family. Some of this letter will, it's like here, the translation is here. Some of it will be read tomorrow night. It's very moving. Now I'm going to turn this over to Felice, who will talk about Nathan a little bit, since she remembers him and I don't. when Nathan Cloud died, and of course I remember him very, very well. I did not know until after he died that he was uh, not my biological grandfather, and I found it out because uh, my sisters and I, I don't think Paula was there, she may have been too young, but my other, Lucille was there, at another relative's house, and they were saying how sorry they were that we lost our grandfather, and what a wonderful son our father had been. But he had gone to see his father every single day during his last illness, and he wasn't even his real father. And my jaw dropped. This was the first time that I had heard that. This was the kind of thing that in those days people did not discuss, and it came as a great shock. But he was a wonderful grandfather. He was the only grandfather that any of us knew. Our maternal grandfather died before any of us were born, and we were very close. He lived near us. He lived with our Aunt Minnie, who lived nearby. He came to see us often. He stayed with us when my parents went abroad. Lucy found a uh, printed program of a, of a event, play that they put on when my parents went abroad and for their fifth anniversary. And Nathan Cloud came to the house and stayed with us. And it was a protest about our being left alone uh, <laughs> while our parents were abroad. He came and he, he spoke German to us very often. And in fact, we spoke German at home. I spoke German before I spoke English. And he read to us in German. I particularly remember Strubelpater. Maybe that's a book that some of the rest of you have heard of. Maybe not. Maybe you're too young. But, uh, he was a loving, warm, wonderful grandfather, and I have nothing but wonderful, very good memories. Um, uh, Jimmy remembers uh, that he turned off all the lights in the office. Uh, and 
and that this was a trade carried through the generations. Uh, we all remember him as being an extremely snappy dresser. I remember him as wearing an all purple suit. He always wore a necktie, and the pictures of him will, I think, bear out. Uh, he wore spats uh, and vests. He was a very formal gentleman, at least in appearance, although he was a, a lovable person. Uh, the information from the Weiss and Clow records indicates that he was much loved by his employees, as is evidenced by their commemoration of this, 70, of this 70th birthday, and the letters sent to him from employees serving in World War I. Um, you can read it, I guess it's available. And the sense of camaraderie and community at Weiss and Clow that began under Nathan Clow's leadership continued when Dave took over and after him when Ivor took over as subsequent presidents. And I think uh, it's... Who's it? Are you coming back? I'm coming back. Okay. <laughs> really I just I want to um, add one thing to, to what Felice just said. But Jimmy also remembers him going out to visit potential customers see if he felt that they were credit worthy during the Depression. Very careful man as well. Before the war, through the concerted efforts of Dave and Minnie, many relatives made it out of Europe in the 1920s and 30s. Minnie and David also provided affidavits that people needed to be allowed into the U.S. Oh, the speaker up. Oh, sorry. Yeah. They provided affidavits that people needed to be allowed into the U.S., provided financial aid, housing, and jobs. Alfred Frankel came in 1900, long before the war threatened. Nathan also sponsored his relatives from Germany, as did Louis Oppenheimer, my grandfather, Minnie's husband. Lutzi Alkali came to the U.S. in 1938 and went to work at Weiss and Clow, where she met her husband, Bernard Oppenheimer. She worked there at least until 1945, when she received her five-year, $1,000 insurance policy. This was one of the many marriages made at W&K, including the parents of Milton Burrell, the comedian. Fred Singer arrived in 1938 and worked for a short time at W&K. Zelia Deje and Eva Frankel also arrived in 38. Nellie Alkali, Nora, and Fritz Schiller arrived in 1939, as did Giza and Leopold. An interesting aside, Michael Singer found a document of a transport summons dated October 21, 1939, in Vienna. Four days later, Giza and Leopold sailed from Rotterdam to the U.S. They had barely gotten away. Giza's son, Paul Franklin, is one of the few who retain, and his family, excuse me, one of the few who retain any form of the original Frankel name. He was extremely smart and musical. Erica Kornbluth reports another family rumor. Paul was considered to be so smart because her mother, Kathy, dropped him on his head when he was a baby. <laughs> you have to know that I've dropped probably all of my kids on their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the secret, folks. Don't throw your children on their heads. Monsi and Max, and Max Reisman went to Shanghai, also with the help of Minnie. Minnie had her hand in many pots, and certainly played a major part in keeping the Frankel clan together. She married Leopold, also known as Louis or L.O. Oppenheimer, in 1909. Minnie was described in the announcement to the New York Times as one of the most popular and attractive oops, favorites of the Harlem Young set. Minnie was also something of a fashion plate. You see what I mean, DG? Hello <laughs> oh was a prominent and perhaps, quote, the best known retailer in the city and was much respected in the business community. He was considered a catch and a most eligible bachelor. Minnie traveled extensively over much of the world annually, both with family and later with her friend, Clara Blumenthal, whoever, wherever you are, Wexler. 
remembered her. Minnie was an organized force to reckon with. One project was getting her son Ira into the Harvard Engineering School. I would like to read you the letter she sent to the dean of the Harvard <laughs> Engineering School. My dear Mr. Clifford, in answer to your request for my son Ira's individual qualities and needs, I'm glad to give you as much information as I can. He has been a member of the Ethical Culture and Fieldson School since his sixth year and has always been interested in the activities of the school. He's been active in most of the athletics as a player or manager. His interest in the scholastic work and in the school itself has been a great part of his life and made friends for him with teachers and fellow students. The enclosed copy of a letter from the teacher in chemistry will give you an idea of his interest in his work. I would like to also add here that that same chemistry teacher kept my mother out of college because she was only 16 when she got out of high school. Okay, Ira was financial editor of the 1930 yearbook and will no doubt be very glad to show it to you. He has a broad knowledge of general conditions as a result of extensive reading and traveling. His habits are moderate. He doesn't enjoy drinking and smokes very little. He's been a little shy, but he seems to be outgrowing it. If there's anything I omitted to say, or if you would like to know anything else at any time, kindly communicate with me. Thank you for your interest in Ira. Cordially yours. This is not exactly how our children get into college these days. <laughs> By the way, he did go to Harvard Engineering School. I don't know if it was a result of that letter or what, but... Um, a far, as I say, a far cry from how people make their way through the maze of the college application process today. Minnie ran an apartment with nine people before her father and husband died in 1938. Herself and L.O., Ruth Gildesgame from Oppenheimer at the time, and Ruth Dreyfus, a Clow relative, Ira and his paternal uncle J.O., Nathan and his round-the-clock nurses, to say nothing of Teddy the parrot. Starting in 1941, she headed the Jewish Orphans Group of the Women's Division of the British War Relief Society, raising funds to open the Sarah Delano Roosevelt Refuge for war-disposed children in England. She was honored for this work and was asked to deliver a reading at the memorial service of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's, Roosevelt's mother, Sarah. Minnie was quite religious, walking every Saturday morning from Park Avenue and 92nd Street to B'nai Jeshurun on Broadway to attend services. The courtyard you will see at 1185, oh, there's the hat, the middle one, the hat that she wore when she met Eleanor Roosevelt as a result of this project. Um, the courtyard you'll see at 1185 Park Avenue was used to bury the silverware that was no longer kosher. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I remember digging up a fork. During the war, Edith Kornbluth, Erica Kornbluth was in England, a 17-year-old making her own way. She recalls that Minnie sent her a precious pound note, allowing her some cherished extras in her frugal life. She also remembered that Minnie sent boxes of cookies made by Julie, her Hungarian cook, another treat. In addition to activities described later, Friday nights were for family gatherings of dinner and poker at Minnie's and at Dave's. At Minnie's, the round poker table contained so many bald Frankel descendants that my parents and Giza would joke that only one candle was needed in the room. The reflections from the bald heads would take care of the lighting. I remember attending seders at her house in the late 40s and 50s with about 65 family members present and during and after the war, also sailors on leave in their starchy white uniforms. As kids, the Oppenheimers and Gildas games escaped under the table before Bernard Oppenheimer started in what seemed like two hours of benching. It seemed that no one listened anyway after four glasses of wine, but the conversation continued in many languages. 1948 was my first time there at the age of five, and also John Ballance on the day of their arrival in the United States. What? You want to know who these people are? Uh, everybody in that photo. You want to know who everybody is? I know most of them. Okay. This is um, Rose and Sepp Braun, who were Clow relatives. My mother and father, Minnie. We were over here, but we'd already left. Um, this is a Lowry, and I don't remember her first name. Leon Gildeskane, Mike. No, that's Danny. Danny, I'm sorry. Ruth. I'm not sure. Is that, who is that? I don't know. This is Leon's 
brother? Is that Pierre? Pierre. Pierre. Looks like Pierre. My mother's brother, Richard. There's Mike over here. And I don't remember who that is. She's What? Is that Ann Allen? Yeah. Of Daniel? Okay. Also a cloud relative. <clears throat> In addition to the Friday night gatherings, family saviors, Minnie also hosted Hanukkah parties and the marriages of several family members in her apartment, including, including Litzy and Bernard's. Excuse me a minute. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. That's Litzy. Fritz. That's Nella and Lawrence Alkali and Fritz Schiller. Fritz Schiller. Who's sitting next to Minnie? Who's sitting next to Minnie? What? Who's sitting next to Minnie? Yes, it must be Alkali. That's Nella Alkali. Lawrence Alkali. Yes, it's there. Next to Minnie. Lawrence Alkali. Mike. Mike. Who's the same person? Who is the one that Minnie? Let's see. Mike. Clara Blumenfeld. Oh. Clara Blumenfeld. On the top and the right. You got it? Everybody happy? Some people think Erica, it's Nella. It is Nella. Erica Cornwood was also married in Minnie's apartment in Minnie's borrowed wedding dress. And when we visited, uh, Leora and I went to see Erica last week on our way down here. And she gave us a picture of her in Minnie's wedding dress, which we didn't have time to include, obviously. After Minnie's death in 1956, Ira and Betty and Dave and Sadie continue these traditions in their homes. In her eulogy, Rabbi Izzy Goldstein of B'nai Jeshurun cited Minnie as, quote, a woman of valor, and state, stated that according to Jewish traditions, she died quietly, quickly, painlessly, and without notice, the lot of the righteous, that God kisses them and they sleep. She also died in the Frankel way, of a heart attack. Um, I'm now going to turn this over to Paula Clow, who will talk about Dave. Okay. Is this right? Yes. Okay. So Dave, or my dad, started Weiss and Clow, age 17, as an office boy. The story has it he couldn't wait to finish school, and I don't think he really did finish high school. Okay, no? Okay. Better? Right. How's that? Good. He served as its president from 1938, after the death of Nathan, <coughs> pardon me, until his own death in 1961. He's described by his children, all of us, unanimously as charismatic, high-spirited, witty, optimistic, <coughs> and upbeat. He seemed always at ease and enjoyed being the center of any group of people. He was sure of himself and did not change his mind easily. Mm -hmm. Dave was someone people turned to for advice and had warm relationships with his children and his wife. Sadie and friends, Jimmy remembers the pride that the Sadie and friends, Jimmy remembers the pride that the employees felt in being part of the team and the love they felt for Dave, many of whom had known him since he was a boy. <clears throat> he seemed to have wanted a son after three daughters. I was the third daughter, and I guess that'd been enough. And before Jimmy, rumor has it that he took Lucille, the second sister, to the barber shop at age two or three to get a boy's hair cut. Do you remember that place? I do. You do? Okay. Yeah. He was also have known to have entered the father-son swimming race with Felice. <laughs> uh, Paula has fond memories of horseback riding in Central Park with him and the family. He represented a dashing figure in World War I uniform. Yep. And he tested gas masks. That's what his job was. During World War II, his job as a warden took him to the streets, checking that all was blacked out in case of air raids. And that I do remember. He was an avid sportsman who loved riding. Doing there. He enjoyed baseball. golf baseball. and uh, skiing, baseball, and golf. 
He enjoyed teaching his children, and with Ira and Betty, he and his family spent many vacations skiing, and even when this was a relatively new sport, we went up to Lake Placid, and it was with wooden skis, rope toes, rope toes, exactly, and very difficult harnesses, and boots that hurt. <laughs> He was mechanical. Okay. He was mechanical, and this would fix it, improving several pieces of Weissenklau equipment, patenting several innovations. This is something that Lucy found. I never, we never knew he had any. Peter found them actually. Peter found them. That he had patents. We're supposed to see here. Oh, okay. Poster over there of his patents. He also designed a method of delivering hot food to patients at Montefiore Hospital, where he served on the board of directors. He provided hands-on assistance as well as philanthropic support. <clears throat> His philanthropic endeavors also included extensive support of Hebrew Union College, the excavation of the Dead Sea Scrolls by Nelson Glick, and the work of UJA, where he was chair of the Venetian Blind Division, and the Development Fund for American Judaism. Dave and Sadie, as we just heard, also hosted family Friday night dinners with dancing and poker games. He was a very good dancer, actually. He was devoted to Nathan and stopped at 1175 Park, his apartment, every evening after work when Nathan was ill to report on the day's happenings. He would go up with all the information and talk to him. And as we mentioned before, Dave and Minnie were both very helpful in expediting family members' immigration to this country. Thank you. Well, I was going to say, do something. Stay away from the speaker. That's fine. Okay. Anybody hear me? Yeah. Yes? Okay. One of the things that Paula just read that struck me was that he was the chair of the Venetian Blind Division of the United Jewish Appeal. They had a Venetian Blind Division? <laughs> <laughs> Ira joined Weissenklau in 1939. Prior to that, he had worked for his father in the L. Oppenheimer stores, where he started from the ground up at the age of 14. He began to follow his father around the meat and produce markets. After college graduate, graduation, he worked for the grocery chain until Lewis died in 1938, shortly after Nathan. He spent a year selling the stores and warehouses of the grocery chain, and then joined the other family firm. He spent the war years in the Signal Corps, and I didn't know what that meant, but my nephew just informed me today that his father informed him that what that really meant for this mechanical engineer was that he was designing guns and weaponry, which I didn't know. While he shared many of Dave's qualities, such as being a person others counted on, he had a very different personality. A dad preferred to be out of the limelight. He was reserved and very warm, with a very wry sense of humor. He was said to be a good judge of character and a careful but silent observer of people. My brother Dan described him as a kind and generous man. He set incredibly high standards for himself and for his relationships with other people, which was not easy always for his children to live up to. Yeah. He was a mechanical engineer by training and like Dave was a tinkerer with great mechanical ability and ingenuity. I was also an avid skier, horseback rider, and outdoors man, spending hours working in the woods of his country home, attired in his pink terry cloth hat, which resided on top of the refrigerator on a soccer ball when not otherwise in use. He served as vice president under Dave. I have fond memories of spending vacation days at the office, bothering Otto, who by trade was a Swiss, op, a Swiss watchmaker, but who was in charge of the small, the small machinery at Weiss and Clow, who always helped me with my collection of broken Big Ben clocks. I also spent a lot of time as a youngster <coughs> making paper, chip, paper clip chains to string across Dave's door to try to trip him. Not a nice occupation, but he was very good-natured about it. <laughs> Jimmy spent many Saturday mornings of his youth downtown when Dave was at work. He would, and I quote, ride up and down in the freight elevator, 
bother the office people and get generally spoiled. He went, hmm? he went to work at Weiss and Clow in the early 50s and became head of the sales department. He also remembers the annual salesman's dinner, always followed by a crap game at the local restaurant. Bill Oppenheim, Dave's son-in-law and Paul, Paula's husband, joined the firm in 1953 and became vice president under IRA after Dave's death. All followed the family and Jewish traditions of philanthropy and active involvement in local and national causes, as well as Jewish institutions. Thank you. You're up, James. I'm ready. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Jimmy talk about Weiss and Cloud. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say that, uh, I don't know what Paul and Felice are doing, but I'm reading Lucy's words. And I'll put in a few thoughts of my own and maybe leave out a few words of hers. And I think Lucy has done an incredible job putting this together. <laughs> and one of the things that she did not mention about Ira is that he never threw anything out. And I think it's very much were, were embedded to him to have many of these memories and have many of these papers. I think, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person around here who worked at Weiss and Cloud. Sadly, as time goes by, the people pass away. You might be interested, I'm still there, still ex-employees in the sales department and so forth that I'm in touch with. I was never head of the sales department. I'm going to put on my glasses and do my best to read Lucy's typing. Um, I might add as well, that a lot of the things that are said here tonight are memories of things that are told to us, things that police remember somebody said and so forth. I certainly never saw Nathan Cloud turn off a light. Uh, he died when I was four years old. But it, it was the story was told and they, people told stories about him even in my days. I was there from 1954 until 1966. Um, okay, as stated before, the company started as peddlers with Paula sewing tablecloths at home, as remembered by Victor Weiss, Emma's grandson in Argentina. I, of course, remember it differently. The stories were told to me was that the company, at the, perhaps not the very beginning, were wholesalers of oil cloth and sold to peddlers. And the people would come in the morning and get, get the oil cloth, take it to the docks, I believe, sell it to stores or whoever they sold it to, and then come back in the evening and, and pay, or the next morning and pay, and get some more. A very popular uh, pattern, I'm told, from that time, was Statue of Liberty, because the sailors would come mm. from Europe, and they wanted to take back a souvenir, and they would take back oil cloth with a picture of the statue, Statue of Liberty on it. I think, if, I don't, who knows when it was built? Somewhere around this time. It was probably new and, you know, new and famous. The company, as was mentioned, was originally incorporated in 1882 as Weiss and Cloud Brothers because Nathan Cloud Samuel, brother Samuel, was a partner. Um, I remember the date, it doesn't say so here, I remember the date of founding as 1887. And I remember in 1987, the company was no longer there, but we had like a 100th anniversary celebration at the old Weiss and Cloud business building, which you'll see tomorrow. Uh, in 1892, the company needed to expand and move to 203 Canal Street. Okay, that's... Oh, I that. Right, you can see, I don't know if you can still see, the but the Weiss and Clown was yeah, the side of the And we used, I used to go with my father to a Chinese restaurant, which was diagonally across the street, partly because we both like Chinese food, but also he liked to make sure the sign was still there. <laughs> anyway, they moved to 203 Canal Street, and continued to sell oil cloth and window shake cloth. And both window shake cloth at that time and oil cloth were a piece of fabric with coatings on it. And they bought from Standard Coated. They bought from a company up in the Upper Westchester in Buchanan, New York, and it was the beginning of a long uh, relationship. In 1896, when Sam died, the company was incorporated as Weiss and Clow Oil Cloth and Window Shades, Inc. It says here, in the 1896, the McKinley <laughs> presidential campaign, Weiss and Clow provided many of the hats and capes made of oil cloth that were worn during parades and events. Mm -hmm. Who knew? 
In midwinter 1903, there was a huge fire in the building, that building, I assume, and within hours, Nathan had the firm doing business again. Within the week, the plant was operating again, despite the fact that there was no roof, only a canvas covering. In 1911, Weissenklau expanded again and moved to 462 Broadway. That before, if that's before it was fixed up. Ira was in charge, and they, you'll see it tomorrow. The outside of it is like marble around the corner. You also see we've been past it a couple of times this week. There's a big going out of business sale on the left there, which is what Daffy's mattresses or something, and you'll see it tomorrow. Um, in mid um, in 1911, Bison Cloud expanded again and moved to 462. Dave Klaus started as an office boy at age 17. In addition to several lines of work clothes and window shades, the firm began making cushions and decorative shelf edging. And they sold to Macy's at the time. Both the cushions and the shelf edging were really made out of oil cloth. Took a piece of oil cloth, made like a sandwich, and put some material in between, and it was a cushion. <laughs> And also, wanna... Jimmy, there's an ad on there from Macy's. Yes, the department. I don't, I don't see it's it. Right there. Well, it's here. Okay. You can find it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. In the 1930s, the firm became associated with Erex. I didn't know that. I always thought that that was the name that we started. A firm in Brooklyn where they made Venetian blinds. Um, Actually, it was, I think, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is now the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And I was there for some years. And uh, it says here that Bernard Pettlissi there. When I, by the time I got to Weissenthal, the Venetian blinds were ready at 462. And Bernard was in charge of the Venetian blind department. And I, for about a year, worked in the factory making Venetian blinds. And I remember, what I remember distinctly about it is at lunch hour every day, can't say all of them, but there was a poker game every every day at lunchtime. <laughs> I lost. Okay. Um, they also patented asbestos stove pads, pot holders. The company began a relationship, which I thought was older than that, with Standard Coated Products, a mill in Buchanan, New York, which produced sanitas, the coated wall fabric, which became a major part of the business. But Standard Coated, I believe, going way back, produced other things that Weston Club bought. Jimmy remembers, okay? <laughs> the trucks, I, I, I submitted some, some thoughts, but the trucks, Weston Club had its own trucks. It was a very well-organized operation. The trucks were brought in empty in the evenings, and there was a whole crew that loaded them, and then they were taken to a garage, and in the morning, the drivers went to the garage and picked up the full trucks and never, you know, never came to Weston Club. They went directly out to make deliveries. Anyway, the trucks on the back said, a blind man is driving this truck. <laughs> a sense of humor. I also remember things were very different then. The city, we had salesmen, and met most of them, about half our business anyway, was in the New York metropolitan area, and they had cars, and they drove a company car. And they weren't supposed to use the company car for anything but going out and selling. And so on the side of the car, it had Weiss and Cloud Company, something that had, you know, an insignia, but they also gave them like little pieces of oil cloth to cover the insignia, because if you went on the West Side Drive, which is, used to be right over there, you weren't allowed, no commercial vehicles were allowed, so they would cover up the name. Okay. They also had the cars, had two, you know, room for two people in front, and there was no back seat. It was like a shelf, so you could put samples or whatever. So you couldn't take your kids out on Sunday driving the company car. Wasn't there a rumble seat? No, but maybe in your time. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I remember, there was no rumble seat. Of course I did. Maybe Dad had a rumble seat. In his car. I don't know. We'll discuss it later. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> celebrating its golden jubilee in 1927. 87 to 27, I think. Weissenklau was known nationally for its products and merchandising. Well, that's what it says. I'm reading Lucy's research and I wouldn't argue. Weissenklau was also well known in other areas of the city. In the 1930s, the Regency Publishing Company 
sent bookbinders to Weiss and Clow to learn how to sew books together. Weiss and Clow seem to have played many different roles in the community. Peter Oppenheimer reports that in the 1960s, Ira got a 4 a.m. phone call from the police in New York. We found dismembered body parts wrapped up in oil cloth. Would you please come down and see if it's your oil cloth? <laughs> when Nathan died in 1938, as was said, Ira, I'm sorry, David took over as president. I believe my recollection, police could tell you better, that quite a long while before Nathan's death, uh, David Clow was really the force running the company. Nathan was sick a while and David was very dynamic and took, I think from an early age, maybe after the First World War, was, was very much involved. My recollection, by the way, please, is growing up there was, in the bedroom, there was like a, a letter from Mike, from Dad's commanding officer thanking him for his service and running a factory or something. So maybe he did more than run, make gas masks, maybe he was a leader of some sort. Uh, in 1966, an accident in the building resulted in the closing of Weiss and Plow, who sold in pieces in 66 and early 67. And soon I went to Puerto Rico and uh, Paula's wife, Bill, stayed on for a number of years, putting everything together and finishing things. Thank you very much. I can't remember offhand which parts of the dispute here between Gates and whatever. One of the things that Weiss and Cloud did was to put out programs, various events. Pardon? This is the um, booklet that was handed out to the dance and frolic of Weiss and Cloud company employees on Saturday evening, December 23rd, 1939. In it, is a history of Weiss and Cloud, born 1887. So you're right. I'm wrong. <laughs> um, it's, it's sort of interesting if anybody's interested in the history of the company. It also has in it several other pieces of the, in the original, which I did not copy, but I did copy the history, and there are um, booklets up here if anybody wants to know more. Um, Weiss and Cloud took care of its, its own family of employees and, as we've said, played an extensive role in the care of the Frankel family and the Blau families and the Klingensteins and the Vipers, my mother's family. Um, in World War I, many employees in the war wrote to Nathan to thank him for cards and support and checks. There's a letter from one of them down here on the posters. One of the many ways, this was one of the many ways that they provided for their employees. There was also a dinner in their honor when they returned, which is also a photograph there for them and their families. With the development of the Mutual Aid Society of W and K, employees also benefited from insurance and disability and death payments. Major birthdays were celebrated. During World War II, the Communiques newsletter was published with direct news from the employees in the armed services support of vets in World War II, annual fall dinners for the entire staff and families, Christmas and New Year's Eve parties at Weiss and Clow, the booklet. Remember Milton Burrow, whose father was a salesman? Milton and his sister often entertained at these end-of-the-year parties, as noted in a letter from Sadie Clow for the celebration of WK's 100th anniversary. Annual summer outings on Long Island, fishing parties, 25th anniversary of employees of the Quarter Century Club, dinners for separate departments, a reading club, and all kinds of sports clubs. In the mid-1930s, the Juan Craft newsletter, monthly newsletter was started with all the news that fits we print, which is a takeoff on the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. This included news of individual families, vacation photo contests, photos of follies and outings, bios of and news from soldiers and sailors. Uh, there's also up here a notebook that has several copies between 1939 and 1946 of some of those monthly newsletters if you want to get an idea of the way employees were included as family. 
Many, in, and in terms of care of the extended family, many family members who came from Europe both before and after the war started at Weiss and Clown. They either stayed or moved on, including the Frankels, Clowes, Klingensteins, Oppenheimers, and um, a man named Ted Weiss. We're not sure if he's related or not, but he was a wrestling champion in World War II, so who knows? <laughs> Alfred's Frankel's son, Carl, daughter and her husband, Gina and Paul Barish, Litzy Alkali, Bernard Oppenheimer, and his brother Ernst, Shondell Ballen, several Clow recipes, Joe Wexler, who moved to Chicago, and as I said, Weiss family members. John Ballen started as an office boy in the summers when he was 15 or 16. Where is John? He just got up. He just got up. Okay, during a wide range of chores, including mail, bank deposits, coffee and snack deliveries, and even working on the switchboard, much to the consternation of the switchboard operators. <laughs> Shondo became the official, the chief financial officer after the retirement of J.O., Minnie's brother-in-law, in the late 1940s. He was also responsible for most of the translations of the old family documents and the letters from Europe until his death in 1967. After that, John and Hava took over this task, which they continue, a service they continue to provide. At the annual W&K dinner in 1937, Nathan Clow was too ill to attend and sent a heartfelt telegram to the event. And I have a copy of it um, that I wanted to read, but it's up here um, on the Western yeah. Union. Oh, okay. As I sit in my room tonight and let pass in review before my mind's eye, the many faithful members of the Weiss and Clow family, my heart is filled with gratitude and appreciation. I cannot speak to each one of you personally, as I would wish to, but I can say to you all, old and young, accept the greetings of a proud father. Mm. Wish you and your dear ones the happiest of New Year's with all the good things in life, yours in fullest measure. Bringing that in from the shore. I am happy, cheerful, and content. God has been good to me, and I give him humble thanks. May he bless you. And something you always I provide, guide. provide, guide. provide for you always, Nathan Clow. This was uh, two months before he died. Wow. Not sure what he died. After the war, once again, Minnie and Dave provided the kind, all kinds of support to those who came, providing affidavits for many who wanted to come. Unfortunately, we only have records of affidavits for Clow and Oppenheimer relatives. Relatives in Europe memorized Minnie's address at 1185 Park Avenue if case help was needed. Zygmunt Neumann was able to let her know after the war that he had survived because he remembered her address. That's where the silverware went. Why did you bury the silverware? If it became non-kosher. How, how did it become non-kosher? I don't know. You put it in the wrong place. You ate the wrong thing with it. You mix the milk and, and the meat. A year in the dirt, as I recall. Correct me if I'm wrong. Shondo Ballin's experience may have been typical. They arrived in 1948 on a Friday with three suitcases and $350 each. They went to Giza's, who moved in with Minnie until they found a place. John, age 14, recalls sitting in the bathtub that night crying and wanting to go home. Despite the fact that he was a businessman and had trained as a professional chef, Chandra tried to get a job as a soda clerk at Nedix, but he had no English, one of several humiliating experiences of many immigrants. The family then worked for Leon Gildeskay, Ruth Oppenheimer's husband, unraveling scarf ends to make friends. Shondal soon became the financial head of Weiss and Clown. He had had the foresight to send some of their belongings, including many paintings, in a lift to Weiss and Clown before the war, where it was stored until their arrival. We know that others also sent things out of Europe. Erica Wald von Kornbluth's parents sent a lift to Switzerland from Vienna, which was brought to the U.S. after the war with the help of many. When they arrived, many stayed with established family members until they were financially and emotionally ready to strike out on their own. Monty came to the U.S. from Shanghai via Palestine. 
Erica and Hannah Waldman, Erica's granddaughters, came to the U.S. Erica spent, I guess they both spent time living with Nellie Alkali when they arrived. And as I said before, um, Erica was married in Minnie's apartment wearing her wedding dress. The gaze of balance went to Australia. Wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Ooh. Shall I repeat anything or did no. you catch it? No, okay. Many family members went to Palestine and Israel both before and after the war. Victor Weiss reported that 38 members of the extended family left Europe after the war with the help of relatives here. Once here, family members maintained some of the strong ties they had experienced in Europe. It was a Viennese, and now I'm repeating what uh, Jessica had to say this afternoon. There was a Viennese baker, bakery, a Claire's on West 72nd Street, and once a week in the 40s and 50s, the Viennese relatives, Nellie Alkali and her daughters, Litzy and Nora, brother Hans and his wife, Naomi, Nelly Frankel, Giza, and I have to turn the page. Sorry. And family and friends gathered to bring the Vienna Cafe experience to their new home. As previously, previously mentioned, during the early 1900s and in the 20s, Paula, with Nathan, Minnie, and Dave, and then Minnie with Ello, Ruth, and Ira traveled to Europe and kept strong connections with the entire family in the Vienna, Bratislava, Budapest Triangle, sorry. The fact that this was possible is an indication of how far the family had come from its immigrant roots. In addition to her travels and family visits, seders and other gatherings at her homes, Minnie kept in touch with relatives all over the world, acting as a clearinghouse for family information. After World War II, she continued this communication, but added care packages. Every six months, she, Giza, and Shanda gathered at the apartment in 1185 to distribute clothing collected by the family to be sent to family members in France, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Austria, as well as Australia and Israel. Giza seemed to know who wore what size, who liked what color, what size shoes the growing children needed every year. When Minnie died in 1956, Ira and Betty, Giza and Shanda continued this practice. It was the sense of importance of family cultivated by Paula and Minnie during, and during their early family trips to Europe that allowed Ira to continue his mother's tradition of collecting family news and sending family newsletters after Minnie's death. The family newsletter that accompanied the packages came about because Ira could not keep up with the correspondence, the individual correspondence, as many had. Fortunately, one copy of these letters remains, thanks to Lucy Neumar's Attic Sleuthing. And there is a newsletter here on the side, and there's some other information on the other side of that. I ran out of space. However, Ira kept meticulous records of everything. As Jimmy said, he also kept everything how the family was related, what went into each package, how much was postage, and he kept files for each family. Um, there's an example, I believe, on the other side of one of a couple of packages, but that's the box that I have with every family's information in it. He kept the files of each family until 1956 when this project seems to have ceased operation. In addition to the clothing boxes, it seemed that separate care packages of food and medication were also sent out three to four times a year. One interesting facet of this endeavor was that the Weiss family members in Vienna were also included. Ira sent monthly funds and food packages for Ignaz, his niece, and her family. These connections con continued at least until 1966. Thereafter, Ira continued to send bufferin and other medicines to the Nedballs in Vienna. In addition, Sarah Weiss, Ignaz's great niece in California, was loaned $1,000 by Dave and Minnie to start a plastics venture. This commitment to family was maintained despite the lack of other connections with Ignaz's family. Even for those in the family whom mem members had never met, the family continued the traditions of food, clothing, financial support, medications, and helping family members make connections with others who might be helpful. There's a letter on here from Sarah Weiss, about Sarah Weiss, um, 
There's a letter connecting Kathy Franklin with the Rabbi David Seligson when she was studying to be a nurse. And with, um, Olinka, connecting Olinka with Pierre Gildesgame in England when she went there to study. These efforts, the sense of family and the renaissance this family is experiencing and will continue to have, is a remarkable achievement of which we can all be proud. So feel free to come up and browse and to take one of these um, booklets of the history of Rice and Cloud, should you be so interested.